This video is brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. Jesus, at least give us one good day of weather for practical accuracy. gonna piss everybody off because we're gonna shoot some influencer and YouTube people's rifles and they're gonna do really well but look at the wind flag Josh this is the blessed rifle and we have been blessed upon the day with low clouds and no winds pretty much the best sighting conditions the best shooting conditions but the problem with this rifle, though, I can point it out to you right away. There's no sniper button. I don't know how we're going to perform without the sniper button. But ladies and gentlemen, we shall persevere. All right. I'm on a target one. Got him. On a target two. Those are up in the neck, you saw, yeah? Yep. I'm on target three. Impact. Impact. Ooh, this is really tight groups too. Target four is going to be the gongs today. Okay. Impact. Impact. Wow. Dude, that was... That was sick. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Got it. Impact. Impact. Those are just on the bottom edge. You saw it? Yep. I'm on the 400 yard target. Impact. Impact. Okay. Wind is picking up a little bit. It's coming from the back uh, towards that direction. Yep. Okay. I'm on at 450. Okay. Which is the base of the flag. Impact. Just off the left edge. Impact. Okay. On at our final target here at five. Mm -hmm. Impact. Wow. Center punch. Impact. Dude, as expected, I mean, it's a laser beam. Yeah. I mean... This is what you get with the most current technology. I think something that we forget while we're running this show oftentimes is that we shoot so many legacy firearms and on top of that we're shooting so many uh, types of ammunition that's just... It's mil-spec ammo that we shoot a lot. So 55 grain, mil-spec, ball... Yeah, so... Dude, do you want to try to shoot it a bit further? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean we definitely know that the rifle is capable to do it, right? See if I can spot him. Just short. Just short. Right edge. Impact. I think that was also an impact, but the plate was still moving from the first shot, so I couldn't see it for sure. So that one was like, I kept on bumping it up, 
and I went to six mils before it hit. I mean, I don't think that was from dispersion. I mean, me being able to send a second shot off that quickly and still get a quick impact tag on it. Yep. I don't think it's a dispersion uh, dispersionary thing. I'm wondering uh, what the what the speed of the projectile coming out the barrel is. Prior, As we walked out, those were your first shots. Yes, prior to this, I only shot 20 rounds to zero in. Right, so this is also, it goes to show you guys, when you're running BDC mm -hmm. uh, or mill reticles or whatever, and if you aren't chronoing the rifle specifically, which in this instance we aren't, if you're not chronoing the rifle to, to develop a dope chart, and even if you are, it's hyper important to confirm at range uh, where your impacts are coming in. We just broke the course record the last go, and this tied with that particular rifle. I don't yep. know which rifle is going to be published. Yeah, we don't know which video first. Yeah. Well, let's head over to the debrief and talk about it a bit more. See you at the debrief. So, turns out this is a very controversial rifle. I did not know that. When we did the debrief, we did not really talk about any of the controversial points because, that, quite frankly, we didn't know it. And um, it wasn't until I posted a few pictures on Instagram that there were a lot of people who gave us feedback on their concerns on the fragility of the components on this. Very peculiar, though. Uh, you're talking about people who had concerns on the polymer lower receiver, which we've been using polymer lower receivers in firearms. R rifles, for instance, the G36 is a very well-regarded assault rifle. The Bren 1, Bren 2 is widely fielded by the Czech Republic. And you also have the SCAR 17 and 16, both also very widely fielded around the world. Pistols, you have the Glock, you have my Walther, that are all polymer components. Polymers have progressed to a point to where they're actually quite durable, if you engineer it correctly. Obviously, if you use the same dimensions as the aluminium lower, you're going to run into problems with the polymer giving up, giving away. But then the other part that I thought was interesting was the concern that the carbon fiber handguard could not withstand the uh, durable use. This was particularly interesting to me because one of my favorite rifles, the Mark 12 Mod O, uses a carbon fiber handguard. In fact, it was from the early 2000s and has seen significant use in warfare by the U.S. Army Special Operations. So, what am I saying? I, I want to hear everybody's comments on this because it is a rifle that is bringing some new ideas into the community. And I think that is healthy for the community. After all, new ideas like the Accuracy International chassis system was a very healthy idea that was brought into the community. But there were also a lot of people when that was brought to the community, they were saying, it's not going to work. I'm curious to hearing what you guys are saying, but I would say just be careful when you're making comments to not make blanket comments that turns out there were success stories like the Mark 12, the G36's Brens and Scars out there. But anyways, let's get back to the debrief. I mean, this is just an interjection. I feel like it's a reset of expectation mm -hmm. because in, as you said, I think we potentially pseudo deceive ourselves when we start to think about what is and isn't reasonable and possible based on the success or lack thereof we've had shooting the different systems out on the range. Right many of which are shot slick, iron sights, ball ammunition, like you said. So when you take a modern configuration with, as you said, modern manufacturing techniques with some of the best possible ammunition you could be shooting mm -hmm. for this particular setup with a modern optic with a gradiated reticle, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, we're setting it up for absolute success and we also had very favorable environmental conditions. Right. So, I mean, that all played into I, the, I would the very say successful though, run. Even if it were unfavorable environmental conditions, sure. I feel like it would have still just work just fine. I mean, we know of course. 500 yards for 77 grain is kind of like child's play, yeah. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's not like se shooting seven six two three nine in mm -hmm. high winds, right? Uh, do you still have to buck winds somewhat? Yes, of course you do. Um, in fact, we do have one shot that was off due to um, when you know, a wind call on my part, I would say. Mm -hmm. But zero to three, I deliberately shot on the heads for all of those, those targets, and not just like headshots, but I was like. I was pushing it. Yeah, you were you were slamming them pretty fast too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm on at 150. Target one. Impact. Impact. Okay. You are a troll. Well, it goes to demonstrate one of the major points of conversation that we have about lightweight setups. Which, for those who might not know what this is or the design principle behind it, this is basically like an ultra light build. Right. And. The reason this thing exists is Ian and Carl over at In Range Forgotten Weapons were coming up with the what were the tenets in designing and Stone, Eugene Stoner designing the M16 or the AR15, right? And so in, in thinking about that, we realized well when Stoner originally tried to build the AR15 concept, well AR10, which right. turned into the AR15. Mm -hmm. There were some basic principles that were in play, which was the use of the most modern materials yep. for an extremely lightweight, reliable rifle. Yep. So you're talking about ultra lightweight setup, no real snag points, using entirely new materials, because polymer was very new. At the time, uh, right. At the time, when you're the thinking 50s. about the M14. Like, mm -hmm. even your fouls were, were running wood, mm -hmm. right? So polymer is a very, a very new type of technology for firearms itself. Um, Aluminium as well. I mean, most of it was steel. Uh, so you're talking about a hyper lightweight projectile, hyper lightweight chassis when compared to you know previous things, and you get an item that is drastically more nimble and easier to just hump around the jungle for you know like 10, 20 clicks, right? Mm. Uh, which to that point, it's funny because our minds are wired to think that. Heavy is good. Heavy is a sign of reliability. Yes. You know, yes. as Boris the Blade Runner would say. It's funny because you look at it from, from, from afar, the handguard is very attractive. It's carbon fiber. It's got that beautiful carbon fiber print on it. I then go to lift it out of the box. And the first thing that shoots through my mind is this feels chintzy. Like this feels cheap mm -hmm. because of how light it is. Right. But it's like, no, wait, wait, this is the reason why they did this. It's, <laughs> it's because they wanted something super lightweight that actually still performs. Right. And then you realize at that point, as you're pulling it out of the box, that you just had like a boomer moment <laughs> of the same guys who were turning in their M14s for the brand new Mattel M16 that is lightweight. And what well, they, they said it was like a BB gun. Mm-hmm. Because it was made of plastic and metal. Right. So, to circle all of that back, you have your ultra lightweight build, yeah. and you were shooting it very fast on the like <laughs> zero to three hundred yeah. area, with the express purpose of demonstrating that despite it being lightweight, recoil control in that type of an environment is still perfectly sufficient and capable. Granted, now you have plopped on a different muzzle device that mm -hmm. does give you a bit of enhancement in that area, but all things considered, like, marginal enhancement. For this particular rifle, I felt that it was so light that I wanted some, you yeah, know, a little give, more... Give yourself a 5 to 10 to 12% advantage on the recoil control yeah. capability yeah. By, by slapping a brake, which makes sense. And obviously, again, it, it worked, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you were able to hammer the targets out yeah. on those closer range shots, like, very fast in a very tight... Mm -hmm. cone of fire and that's one of the main areas again that people would generally critique when it comes down to ultra light setups mm -hmm. the other being whether or not it can be used in a more precision role because again small amounts of force added into the firearm cause greater amounts of deviation it's part of why when you get into precision setups they're generally speaking really dang heavy right yeah right so i mean when you get to prs shooters they hang weights literally just putting weights on the gun for the purpose of keeping it more stable right but again for the context of what we were doing just shooting sub torsos out to five and then i think we took some shots also out to 650 to record mm -hmm. some hits yeah, yeah. Uh, and they were successful all successful without any real issue and i, I would say too so when I put this together for the course, 
I could have used the micro dots that Ian and Carl like to use on, on theirs, which perfectly fine. It, it would have been an, an, like paperweight at that point, like mm -hmm. sub paperweight. Mm -hmm. But I decided to use the SLX 1 to 8 uh, Griffin Mill. And that was a deliberate choice. I wanted to find something that was still light enough, so that still went on the light realm. Yeah, right. But at the same time, gave me some type of PID um, self-spotting cap capability when you know when I was shooting the rifle. Well, when you look at this, you've got the arrow mount, which is ultra light, and yeah. you've got the SLX, which is also on the much lighter end of the LPVOs. It's definitely a weight-conscious optic. Mm -hmm. And again, when we pick this up, like if I pick this up, it's still, I don't consider it this even is, remotely close to being. It's still lighter than this. You, right, precisely. So Which it, it, this compared to the stuff that much, you and I usually shoot? Much lighter, yeah. So, I, so again, to the point of having an LPVO in this setup, I think it works absolutely perfectly, especially because some of the choices you chose when selecting the mount and the optic were to maintain that that weight discipline that, that we're after mm -hmm. with the overall build here. So on the topic of accessories, I know Josh and I bounce between this all the time and he's actually brought this up, but we forgot to talk about it in the debrief. Yes, there are obviously your grip stops, your vertical foregrips, your bipod mounting surfaces, your Picatinny rail interfacing. But is M-Lock suitable for mounting IR laser aiming devices? The bottom line is the best practice is to have an integrated pick rail on top integrated into a metallic handguard um, for the current technology. And that provides a very solid mounting surface for inter uh, infrared devices. Now, can it be done on uh, carbon fiber? Yeah, of course you can mount. Um, M-Lock Picatinny slots on the top. I mean, it'll work until it doesn't work, I suppose, but uh, it's doable for sure. Um, now, this was, again, very peculiar to me that people would bring that up as a point of concern for accessories because that literally is the carbon fiber hangar that you use on the Mark 12 Mod Zero. A lot of times, guys had a an extended swan rail to mount like a clip-on night vision device, or they would have your D-balls or PEC units on the side, whether you're trying to call in indirect direct fire, whether you're trying to use it as passive aiming. So is it possible to mount infrared and night vision capable devices onto carbon fiber handguards? I mean, I think the answer is yes. It just depends on your specifications when you're calling out for a contract. Now, how many people do actually run infrared night vision laser devices on their rifles out there in the general public? And does that warrant for a Picatinny rail integrated carbon fiber handguard that is enabled for that? I mean, I think that's a conversation for whoever is purchasing the firearm for their own use. In conclusion, then, for my purposes, the weight to performance balance is heavily weighed mm -hmm. towards performance <laughs> because generally speaking, when I am gonna have my firearm, it's in the context of being in my vehicle or immediately near my vehicle, in my home or on the range. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I'm having to go hump around and climb mountains with. If it were, I'm sure my perception and philosophy on which gun I'd take and which gear I'd add to it would be adjusted. Right. So. For me, I like lightweight uh, rifles, and it's not because I can't carry a rifle. I mean, in the, in the military, humping, I don't know, like 10, 15 miles and, you know, with a 240 or 249, I mean, that's, that's normal. That is kind of like a base requirement of stuff. That doesn't mean that you need to kit everything out to that weight for the sake of kitting out to that weight. I mean, in, in that perspective... A machine gun is that weight because it is a machine gun. You right. Have just to lay because, down right. Just because you can carry the weight doesn't mean that you have to or should carry the weight. Right. Down. And this is this is a topic that frequently comes up in like M14 and foul episodes for some reason. Like people, when I say that I would rather have something lighter weight, it's not that I cannot carry that, 
but I could go longer distances if I had less of that weight on the rifle. Mm-hmm. Um, another fringe benefit to that is when you're shooting in strange and awkward positions. Having a weapon, and bullpups are great for this, either balanced or rear balanced, making it very pointable, is uh, very advantageous when you're shooting from awkward positions, per se. Um, now, again, the muzzle brake is there for a reason, because a lightweight rifle is not the best at soaking up recoil. Mm-hmm. So two ways you could do this, tuning the gas system, but then also having a decent muzzle brake. Technically, having a suppressor as well, but I think this is a good point of talking about the light, the pencil barrel. Actually, when I was shooting it on range to, um, you know, as as we were doing evaluations, we saw once it was suppressed the, using the OSS suppressor, it did not add any gas in the system, but it was dropping the point of impact about four to five inches. Now, if you are unaware of that, that is severe. But if you are aware of it and know that that is your drop, then that is okay. However, I would say, um, so my theory is because it's got a thin barrel inside of a free-floated system to where there is no other support for it when you try to droop the barrel down. I'm theorizing, and we could test this. I'm theorizing this, and we could test this down on the range, is that when you let's say shoot if you're shooting under obstacles your rifle is banked to a side potentially that would give you a nine o'clock point of impact shift or a three o'clock depending on which way you're holding it that is more of an issue than a point of impact shift in my opinion right it needs to be consistent one way or the other like you want it to be consistent so it's something that we need to to look at at a a heightened level of yeah i agree so obviously, with 77s, highly lethal, mm-hmm. both speed and uh, it being able to handle the distances that you would typically throw at a carbine like this, um, weighing in less than this in the entirety of the package. That is impressive. Agreed. So I think we'll spend some more time on this, but we do need to thank Ian and Carl. Uh, for setting us up with the rifle and also thank Brownells for sending the rifle out for us to evaluate. Let's see what else we come up with in, in the classic. See you guys next time. Subscribe to our newsletter at slateblackindustries.com where you can get updates on 9-hole review publications and access the Practical Accuracy Scoreboard to help you argue with people on the internet on which rifle performs better on the Practical Accuracy course. We maintain this newsletter to be majority gun content with 9-hole reviews updates per every email with less than 33% marketing content. Subscribe today on slateblackindustries.com. 516, this is 096, 4 Vic, 8 packs, Redcon 1, green to green, top copy, over. 096, this is 